Embracing healthy thinking, myths and conceptions regarding mental health or illness. Uh, this is the third part of a, what I think is a really important series called Embracing Healthy Thinking. I know that during this COVID time, um, thinking matters. We, we've been talking about it. People have been having a difficult time uh, thinking straight, uh, sorting through the voices and messages coming from media, from neighbors, from family. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. So I thought, let's, let's dig into this. Let's explore how to have um, a pattern of healthier thinking. And in order to do that, there are some myths we need to dispel. And I want to begin today. Today's talk is going to be about dispelling these, these myths and misconceptions. So um, I, I hope you'll appreciate this. I came across this great picture in light of all the stuff that's going on, even with the rioting going on in the States, the Friday morning grounds and grace group. We had a great conversation. Uh, we talked a bit about the violence, the prejudice, the uh, how do we approach this? And when I came across this picture, it seemed to really sum it up. You either see God in all or you don't see God at all. And uh, I thought that's a powerful way to see it because I believe the, the ultimate goal of Christian love is seeing Christ in all and loving everyone. That's the goal. Uh, not to be right, not to be wrong. It's not about that, but loving everyone as Christ loves us. So uh, we covered that for a number of weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So anyway, that's Let's get into this introduction. We've got three things we're going to cover today. First, misconceptions regarding mental health, misconceptions regarding PT, oh shoot, PST, I wrote it wrong, post-traumatic stress syndrome or disorder. Um, oops, well, I'll correct that when we get to that slide. I know, I know it's corrected later. Uh, misconceptions from traditional church regarding mental health. Yes, uh, these, are, these are really big misconceptions. So let's dig into mental health. And by the way, I need to say this carefully, uh, clearly, um, because I know the last time I spoke on this topic, uh, and this was a couple of years ago, there were individuals in sitting right there in the church that were dealing with mental health issues that have lifelong issues. Um, there were people watching online later that authentically struggle with it, that are on medication, that uh, it, the point is this, this is not a cookie cutter message. I'm going to, I may misspeak and I hope I don't, I really don't because I'm learning each time I do this, I try and do better. This is not trying to give a, um, this is the answer. I'm trying to open the gateway for people to see and understand mental health better. And by removing some of these misconceptions or calling them out, um, we're saying you can't use that misconception as your grounds to believe what mental health is all about. It's deeper. It's wider than I ever thought. In fact, um, a couple months ago, I think it was just before Christmas, I was invited to a, a, an event in Kitchener. We had, the fire department had this profound event sharing with um, uh, firefighters and their families the real uh, struggle between, uh, behind mental health and PTSD um, in the workplace. And in fact, they, they kicked out the fire chief and, and some of the top officers and said, you guys go, we need to have freedom to be able to speak freely even though those individuals were respected, they wanted to give families and those that were going to share their story um, a safer place to be honest. And again, mental health, I am learning so much about it. This is not the ex exhaustive discussion on, but I believe we are going to dispel some pretty important myths. So please, please bear with me and hear my heart in this. Uh, I may miss points. If you uh, come across other really important myths that should be on the list, email me. Uh, so I will add it to the next time I talk about this, because this won't be the last time I promise. So back to, back to misconceptions. Um, let's, let's dig into this. The first one, it's a myth. Mental illnesses aren't real illnesses. I can't believe how many people think this is true. Um, they think it's, it's, it's something only, well, we're, we're going to get to in, into what some of the myths are, but the idea that it's not a real illness, a real illness is cancer. A real illness is MS. A real illness is a diabetes uh, or whatever. 
um, epilepsy. They don't consider mental illness as a real illness. That's a myth because it truly, truly is. The next one. Some of the so-called mentally ill are just making excuses for their weaknesses or failure. <laughs> this is something I've heard for sure. And again, every one of these myths I've heard from people, they've expressed them, um, which is crazy. Uh, then these people continue on saying, these people need to stop whining and get off their couch and go find a job. Have you ever thought that about somebody? So why don't they just change their attitude? Why don't they just read, read a positive thinking book, get out of bed, you know, have a shower, that'll make you feel better, then just go on with your day. And really what they're saying is, you're making me uncomfortable. So be careful with a quick judgment of, of seeing those that are struggling with mental illness or depression or anything else that's connected to it uh, as a weakness or failure and that they're just making excuses. There's something real going on. So again, this is, this is a big deal. Don't, don't take it lightly. And I really hope this will uh, help impact um, uh, you in dispelling myths and helping stop the spread of bad information, fake news. Number three, huh, bad parenting causes mental illness. <laughs> how many times have we said this or heard this? Oh my goodness, look at that kid. Yeah, but look at how the parents are treating their kid. So to say that mental illness is caused by bad parenting as a blanket statement is false. Uh, does bad parenting contribute to mental illness and mental ill health? I believe it does, but you can't be going around as a non-professional and make a quick blanket statement like that. It's, the har it's a harsh, unloving thing to do. So that's, that's myth number three. Myth number four, people don't recover from mental illness. This is a myth, people. People do recover. This is a treatable thing, all right? And we'll, hopefully we'll get into that later, but this is not, I'm not here as a professional to talk about all the ways you can help people with mental, mental illness or mental health, but I am gonna call out some of these myths and some of our Facebook professors like to proclaim they know so much about all these topics, including COVID-19, including the hand washing, including politics, oh my goodness. So this is just part of the myth and, and fake information that goes around. And I want you to see that, hey, people can and do recover. It is treatable. Um, anyway, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see what I mean when I get, get around to this. Myth number five, people who experience mental illness are weak and can't handle stress. This is a myth. Um, in fact, uh, those who've ever struggled with it, even if it's only for a period of time in your life and you've recovered, for that time that you were in that episode, you may have felt weak, but you, you may have been a strong person all along. And it, this, is, this is not about uh, only those who can't handle it, that are weak uh, and can't handle stress, uh, catch this, or uh, deal with mental illness. No, this is not true at all. You have much more learning to do. In fact, I encourage you to explore some um, seminars or workshops or videos on uh, understanding mental illness and mental health better. Number six, myth number six, kids can't have a mental illness like depression. Those are adult problems. It's a learned thing. <laughs> Talk about a, a myth. Um, this is completely untrue. Um, it's not an adult issue. And we're going to talk later about uh, some things that can lead to mental health when we talk about PTSD. And I'll explain that when we get there. That's myth number six. Myth number seven, mental illness is destructive, but thankfully it's still not all that common. Ha! <laughs> That's a myth. I think uh, mental illness, mental health um, is very common. We just, we're just really good at masking it or ignoring it, or plugging, plugging our ears, our fingers into our ears, la, 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 I'm not listening, or covering our eyes, I can't see it, you know, or you cover your mouth, you don't talk about it. So this, yes, it's destructive. It's destructive to the one whom it's harming, and to those who love that person, and those who are around them. 
but it is very common, much more common than you want to believe. So please don't uh, run and say, hey, it's not that common. Number, number eight, mental health disorders are biological. It comes from bad genes. This is, is a myth. Can, okay, the reason this is a myth is because some people are using this as a blanket statement that all mental health stuff comes from, uh, it is hereditary or is biological or whatever. Well, that's not true. Things are brought on by trauma. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, uh, they're not just a closed biological thing. Here, pop a pill and you're fine. That's not how it works. Those who are struggling with mental health or have struggled um, are, are deeply hurt when, when this topic is just taken so lightly and flippantly. So that's why I want to express these myths and do it with gentleness and love. Um, so that we learn how to talk to others about this, so that if we do encounter someone with issues or dealing with this illness, that we're loving and kind and don't say the dumbest things. It's, it's like going to funerals and saying dumb things, you know. Uh, you mean well, but they're wrong things you can say. All right, myth number nine. People can recover from depression or anxiety orders with drugs alone. <laughs> this is a myth. Uh, some people think, um, oh, we got to put them on drugs. And there are, okay, here's the problem. I know many families who've gone to doctors uh, who uh, the doctors have, very first thing they've said, great, let's try them on medication. Very first thing is meds. Um, I, I know firsthand of, of individuals who were not counseled. There was, they were not sent to a counselor or psychiatrist first. They were just immediately put on drugs. And this is hard because there's, an, there's a mindset that says drugs alone can fix it. That's not true. Drugs alone can't. Do they help? Yes, they do. But I promise you there are many who are on prescriptions that actually hate the drugs they're on. It does something else to them that they don't like. So it's not so clear cut. It's not such a quick flippant answer. So be careful when you're talking about that and just think here, take some drugs, you'll be fine. Number 10, last one, last myth on mental illness and mental health. When the mentally ill attempt suicide, it is a cry for help. This is a myth because you think there's an intentional uh, screaming for help. That's not what's happening here. I believe it's much, much deeper. Uh, the darkness can be so dark that when they do try to attempt uh, to take their lives, they don't realize what they're doing. It isn't about crying for help. It's more like trying to make the pain stop. They don't really want to die. I remember my own story where, where I've tried to take my own life as a late teenager, uh, just in my 20s there. Like, I tell you... It, I wanted all the, the agony and weight to go away. It wasn't, it was not a cry for help. Hey, uh, is anybody watching? Hello over there. Hey, I'm about to do this. No, not at all. So please, please, please don't, don't treat those things as a, uh, that's just a stunt. There is something much darker and deeper going on. And uh, uh, here, here's what I really believe. You, you got to hear this. Uh, I believe Jesus is there with them at that very moment of darkness. God's not absent from that darkness. And sometimes he hugs them into eternity. He does. So God's not absent from it. it this is a heavy topic. Anyway, let, let's, we're not here to talk about this as the primary theme. So let's move on to the next one. Here's a better way to view it. I believe this happened at that uh, event I was at last November. Uh, I think that's where I got this quote from. And I wanted to share it with you because I think this is a very, very helpful quote to view mental illness. Because we usually think oh, mental illness, uh, somebody's sick. But here's something else that I want you to see. Call it, instead of calling it mental illness, call it mental unawareness. They are unable to see. They may be unaware of a healthier lens. So just put that in your um, uh, folder of uh, definitions just to expand your understanding of this very, very heavy, heavy topic. 
let's go into uh, uh, PTSD, misconceptions. Uh, it stands for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. So myth number one about PTSD, and, I, and again, I've learned a lot about this through my fire department chaplaincy. Years ago, when I was in Fort Erie, I became the chaplain for the Fort Erie Fire Department. And one of the first things they did, and by the way, this is right after 9-11, um, one of the first, the first things they did is they brought all the regional uh, mental health and health professionals and emergency service people together and be, began a training uh, in PTSD. And so there were many levels of training. I, I made it through the first uh, big level where I was able to be called in into a group session to help do, do some debriefing. But we began learning some myths pretty quick. So this is not a new topic to me. I've been learning about this for 20 years. And so I'm only going to give you four myths today about uh, PTSD that are really important to know. Um, PTSD only happens to those who can't handle tough situations. Again, this is a mis misconception. Um, in fact, if I, if I can leak a bit of information to you right now, because I, I'm, I'm not, the other uh, three aren't coming to my mind at the moment, but PTSD is not about not being able to handle tough situations. PTSD can hit you, um, uh, I'll, I'll use the fire department for an example. Um, when I was in Fort Erie, I visited a lot of scenes, a lot of accidents, a lot of house fires, uh, even when people passed away. And uh, some of the firefighters, they, they saw it all the time. But for some reason, there could be just one event that can trigger it. And they're able to handle tough situations all the time. But what is it that triggered them that time? So it is not uh, about not being able to handle tough situations. So it's, it, that's why this is a myth. Myth number two, PTSD isn't something you can overcome. Uh, there's an, um, a false impression that's given to uh, frontline workers that once you have PTSD, you're broken for life. This is not true. I have heard story after story of individuals who, are, who have come through and are coming through the healing of this very traumatic thing. And it's usually a number of factors that contribute to uh, how PTSD um, hits. So that's a myth. Number three, PTSD occurs instantly after a traumatic event. Well, that is a myth because this can develop over time from a single event. Your body may be protecting you from something you saw that was horrific, but your body shut down that memory, especially children. children this happens to kids all the time. This happened to me as a kid uh, from the sexual abuse I went through. You know, I didn't realize it could be PTSD. I never put those two things together. I don't consider myself as one suffering from PTSD right now, but I believe I did suffer from it. And I know for sure my mother did in light of the events she went through in her life. So again, the reason this is a myth is because people think it, you're going to have that. You're, people mistaken shock for PTSD. When there's a car accident and you're, you suddenly get out of the car, somebody asks you how you're doing, you're fine. You say, I'm fine, I'm fine. But what you don't know is you're bleeding like crazy. You're broken all over the place. But your body is in such shock um, that you're, it's just a way to cope and react with a, with a crisis. PTSD can come out of that, all right? It can come afterwards, depending on what's happened to you or what you've seen. So, again, this is, this is not just an instant thing. So, some, the reason this is a myth is because people months later um, suddenly have these dreams, these, these problems that come up, and... Uh, somebody will say, well, that can't be PTSD. It's too long after the event. So that's why this is a myth. All right, number four, PTSD is a sign of mental weakness. Well, this is a myth. And it's, I think this is a leading cause that prevents the one who is suffering to go seek help. All right, they're, they're afraid to admit to their coworkers, I am actually struggling right now. Their coworkers probably totally see it already. They see the behavior changes. They see the, the attitude changes. So again, this is, this is uh, uh, PTSD is not a sign of mental weakness. So what are some things that can contribute to uh, uh, some types of trauma that contribute to PTSD? Here are some big ones. Uh, some are common, some are not. Combat, going to war, 
ex being exposed to very violent situations can totally bring on PTSD. I know somebody personally who has, has struggled with that, been to war, uh, dealt with uh, very ser serious situations and it's affecting them today. Childhood physical and sexual abuse can lead and affects PTSD. Now take that on top of more violence when you're older. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there's more going on here than you think. Physical assault, being threatened with a weapon, and an accident. Uh, many other traumatic events can also lead to PTSD, such as fire, natural disasters, mugging, robbery, plane crashes, torture, kidnapping, life-threatening medical diagnosis, terrorist attacks, and other extreme or life-threatening events. Let me throw this in, too. For those that are suffering already from a thing called anxiety, an event like COVID-19 can trigger a, enough stress and cause a PTSD. PTSD uh, reaction. So be careful, be loving to those that, that are struggling. This is not a simple, simple thing. All right, next one. Misconceptions from traditional church regarding mental health. Yes, the church has not done a good job in uh, um, uh, the whole idea of understanding what mental health is. And you're going to hope, well, you'll, you might chuckle or go, oh, brother, I totally get that one. So let's dig into the church ones. If you've been part of church for any long length of time, you'll have heard this. Uh, myth number one, it's demonic. Oh, my goodness. How many times... Have we heard, oh, that person is filled with a demon. Look at what they're struggling with. And they, they quickly resort to uh, spiritual blame. When in all honesty, folks, how much do you or I really know about spiritual things? Now, careful for the one who just said, well, I know a lot. Oh, my goodness, I have the answers. Listen, you're probably the most dangerous. Honestly careful with that attitude. You don't know everything. None of us do. So just because you have an insight into something doesn't mean you're right or yours is the only right answer. Okay. This is about um, calling out these, these flippant answers that I've heard. Okay. Now, listen, I know people who have claimed to have been possessed by a demon and they were released and freed. I've, I've heard stories. I've heard people who have been part of casting them out. I've heard of, um, uh, okay, I've heard enough stories after 30 years of being in pastoral ministry, okay? So for me to say this, um, there's something about this. So please don't run to this demonic uh, escape route. And, and explain it away. I think it's extremely hurtful and very unhelpful. I don't even think this word should come into this the, into the discussion when we're having serious conversations with somebody about their state of mental health and wanting to get help. Leave this conversation out of it. It's unhelpful. That's my opinion. My opinion. Number two, myth number two. These are lines that are said. Somebody has said, well, then you're not trusting Jesus for your sufficiency. So this is a, a response from, uh, from church folks, um, quite traditional ones. I don't hear it as much today because uh, people are growing and maturing. So it's good. It's good news. But these are statements that have been said. And here's the problem with this myth. Uh, it's a focus on what you can't do right. It's all about guilt and shame. You aren't trusting Jesus for your sufficiency, which means you have to know what the word sufficiency means. Don't you know your identity? Don't you know about this Jesus? Well, then you can't be a real Christian if you don't believe this stuff. Like this rabbit trail of guilt and shame is painful. So when we talk about mental health, those that are struggling, um, you, don't, you don't just say, oh, go see a counselor or you need to see a pastor or you should pray more. Oh my God goodness. These are horrible and hurtful things that I've heard said. And unfortunately, ugh, I think I've even said them, which stinks because number one, I didn't know better. And number two, it was wrong. Ugh. Number three, myth number three, you need more faith. After all, it's all in your head. Another similar hurtful jab at somebody in pain. How is this comment going to help that person who's struggling right now? 
their, their thoughts are racing like crazy. You don't know if it's medical or biological. You have no clue, but you're going to throw this at them. It's all in your head. Uh, guilt and shame, again, it's implying the one saying it is superior. So if you're saying this to someone else, you're now a judge. You have just judged horribly. And by saying it's all in your head, well, it just clearly shows you know nothing about mental health and mental illness issues. So it's better you just put a, put a pipe in it and be quiet. Don't say anything because um, you're, you're creating more harm than help. Myth number four, you are healed, so walk in your healing. All right? Th I've heard this. And this is, this is not just for mental health. This is also for those who are sick. And th it's a flippant phrase. And it's telling people, well, here's, here's a, a phrase you need to understand. Oh, you don't understand it? Well, then you need to understand because I understand it. And since I understand it, I know more than you do. So this person's flipping it back onto the person who um, is feeling ill or dealing with, with the mental struggles. You aren't doing something right. So get with the program. This is a very trite thing to say. So please, this church, church world mentality of unlove, I'm not talking about the real church, the church of Christ, the one who loves Jesus and loves all the others and sees Christ in all, wouldn't say something like this. And if you did, go repent, go say sorry, and, and fix up your, your misquote. And may there be grace in that as well. Myth number five, that mental health and illness is only for baby Christians because mature believers don't struggle with mental health. Another horrible myth. Do you see the pattern of shame and guilt when we pretend to know what we're talking about? That's why I want to bring this up. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because if we're going to talk about um, embracing healthier thinking, you need to dispel some of the myths. Get rid of this stuff that's going on. I love this next picture. This is a great illustration that uh, expresses a misunderstanding uh, of anxiety because there are many who are suffer from huge anxiety issues, which sometimes falls under mental health, mental illness category. But when we hear those who don't get it, we think, well, you're just worrying all the time. We just flippantly say, you're just worry, worry, worry. Well, here's what anxiety actually feels like. It's like sweating a lot, second guessing yourself, muscle tension, trouble sleeping, chest pain, overthinking all the things. Uh, increased heart rate, your mind and body refusing to cooperate no matter what you know is rational. These, these are the thoughts that go on into people's minds and hearts. This is a really big deal. So just consider how this, this needs to be expressed and shared. Um, it looks like uh, my, um, I might be offline, so hopefully it will catch up. If it doesn't, I will wrap this up uh, right now. Oh, looks like I'm back on. So anyway, this, this chart is a really nice, gentle way to compare and gives you more grace for the other people uh, that are authentically struggling with anxiety. Uh, ask questions, seek to understand, seek to be understood. So anyway, I think this is, this is kind of cool. Enjoy. Next one. We're almost done here. What we believe matters. Hence, the misconceptions must be dealt with. That's why I spent so much time walking through all those misconceptions because they have to be dealt with. What we say matters, uh, hence becoming aware of our patterns. Uh, I'm going to take just a couple more minutes, three more minutes, and because uh, this is taking longer than I wanted to, but that's okay. I was told, don't worry about that. Go on a little longer if you can. So I am, just a couple more minutes. So what we say matters. Take a look at this. Do you remember the story we tell children all the time? I thought Gail could do this one, where you, uh, you take a, a, a toothpaste tube, ask the uh, kid in front of you, hey, uh, can you squeeze it out? Yep, put it in and squeeze it out. Now you tell the kid to put it all back in. Well, he can't. Once it's out, it's out. That's the same with our words. Our words matter. How we say things. And sometimes we say hurtful things. It's crazy. Your words have power. Use them wisely. And I see this happen with children all the time. I grew up with horrific um, yelling, taunting, name calling, shame screaming at me. 
not only from my mother, who was probably the worst person in my life, um, but from, you know, from others. I won't, I won't get into that because I don't want to name, name people. But they affect us as we grow. These affect us as we mature. So, um, honestly, watch your words. I love this next picture. I think we're almost done. You can't change how you feel without changing your thoughts. You can't change your thoughts without changing your focus. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this series. I'd like us to change our thoughts. I'd like us to change our focus. Because if we've been doing something the same way for so many years and things aren't changing, well, then we got to change some things. And what can we change? We begin with our thoughts. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I think this is for everyone. God wants us to live an abundant life. Live life in all of its fullness, it says in the NLT. Life better than you ever dreamed of in the message. Um, life in its most complete form. And I love this the best in uh, Passion Translation. Translation It says, uh, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Abundant. This is the goal. This is the hope. So next week when we come back, I want to take a look at six patterns of thinking that hinder a healthy mind. And then a week after that, uh, we're going to take a look at three powerful actions that will empower and enhance a healthy thinking pattern. So that is what today's message is for. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you're encouraged by what you heard and uh, share this uh, video with others. Um, was today's message helpful? please comment and let me know. Um, yes, there's comments ahead of time. Hey, we're here. It's all fun. But I don't get a lot of feedback afterwards, per se, on how it came across. So it'd be interesting to hear what